start a new series, a new series of messages. I don't know, maybe three, maybe four parts. I don't know. Definitely two parts. You don't want to miss next week. Uh, but um, this series I've titled Better. So we're going to be talking about better. Uh, and I'll explain here in a minute. But uh, personally, I'm very thankful for a lot of things. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for God and what he's doing in, in my family and, and uh, just the health of my, my family and everything. I'm thankful uh, that he's protecting my son. I have a four-year-old son. He, um, he turns five in January. And right now, him and the cousins, they're into BMX riding bicycles. And I'm thankful that he has protected him because he's falling hard on a few occasions. But he has protected him, and, and I'm thankful for that. But uh, my son right now, he's in a BMX kick, and uh, I was sharing with Trent earlier that whenever I get a chance, I show this picture because it's awesome, right? <laughs> so whenever you have access to PowerPoint and a microphone, you can show whatever picture you want. But uh, this is my son in front of my house, just going off a ramp, and uh, right now everything he talks about, everything that he wants to do is ride his bike. So I bought, he, I bought him, um, this little toys, they're, they're these little BMX bikes that uh, that you play with fingers. It's like a finger bike. And uh, I should have known that they were pretty crappy when I bought eight of them for like five bucks on Amazon. Uh, really, they're not supposed to be, they're really not toys. I, I kind of, I see that they're like, they're almost like party, like for theme parties, you know, for like birthday, you want to put a little bike on top of a cake. Well, yeah, they're pretty crappy because after a couple days, this is what's left of the bike that uh, that I bought him. Like every couple of days, I had to break out a new one and give it to him because he just kept breaking them off. This part's plastic or whatever. But um, anyway, I just got to thinking about some of the other toys that he has, right, that are more durable. For example, Legos. How many people play with Legos? Anybody? I can, I can, I still play with Legos. They're the, they're the awesomest thing. And these are, you know, because now there's like, you know, uh, ninja Legos and like frozen Legos. We got the ghetto Legos, right? Like squares and you made, you know, whatever. But uh, Legos, man, Legos are the strongest toy. You can throw them, you can drop them, you can vacuum them up. Like they'll break your vacuum cleaner before you break a Lego, right? Like. I mean, God forbid that you step on a Lego because I'd rather walk on hot lava than step on a Lego. Like Legos are the strongest and the most resilient toy and uh, they just out, they, they withstand a lot of damage. But um, you might be here today and you're wondering, why are we talking about BMX and Legos? Well, I'm talking about this because um, when it comes to life, I don't know about you, but when it comes to life, I'd rather be like a Lego more than I would rather be like this crappy bike tool. You know what I'm saying? Because in life, we are going to go through trouble. We're going to go through heartache. We're going to go through difficulties, through problems. And, um, and, and I want to be a resilient type of person that is going to withstand, that I'm not going to be broken down, depressed, and lose all hope just because I go through trials. I don't want to end up like this just because I go through difficulties, amen? I wanna be strong and resilient. This is what it kind of represents. I, I thought about buying a bunch of Legos and have you walk out of here with a piece of Lego to remind you, but you probably have these thrown around your house. So whenever you're picking up Legos, if you have small children, then think about that because um, that, that really is, a Lego really does to me anyway, it really does represent strength, durability, and um, and resilience and, and that's what I want to talk about today because we're starting the holiday season and it has been proven it has been documented it has been concluded that um, even in the, the holiday season it's a beautiful time of year where you get to share with loved ones but it's also a time of year where stress goes up right where depression goes up I, I actually found this graphic that talks about depression and stress statistics during the holiday season and I don't know if you can see it but it says that 45% of Americans uh, they dread the holiday season and I, I like the little beach umbrella because I'd rather go to the beach than celebrate Christmas honestly but I love Christmas it's one of my favorite times of year 
Women feel uh, more negatively affected because we know that women, men, you guys do a lot during Christmas for the family and pictures and the cooking. And we do during Christmas and, and the holidays what we don't do all year round. We're trying new recipes and all kinds of stuff. You don't do that all year round, but we try to do it during the holidays. And it's also a big stress, you know, because of the, the, the money that we spend. 38% uh, feel an increase in stress over the holidays, and there's some more statistics there. But um, to start today and before we pray, I just want to share today's message in a sentence. If it's your first time, every week I try to share with you one thought or one idea so that if you walk out of here or if you, if you don't hear anything else that I say, I want you to walk out of here with something, something that you can remember. And uh, my message in a sentence today is that Jesus not only makes your life better, but Jesus makes you better at life. Amen? Anybody want to say amen to that? Amen. Jesus not only makes your life better, but he <laughs> makes you better at life. And, and I don't know if you are interested in a better life or just being better at your life, but that's what Jesus offers us. He offers us life in abundance. He really does make us better at our own life. Now, I'm not trying to preach or sell you on anything. Trust me, I'm not trying to say that if you believe or you follow Christ, you're never going to have troubles again. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is that every time that we gather in church, every time that we open this book, every time that we go to God's word to study it, to read it, to, to, to memorize it, it, this is not just about these lofty spiritual claims and ideas that are so over our head that they don't apply to our everyday life. No, we, we value this book. We value the truth of God because we believe that it's a book that, that God left to us to, to lead us, to teach us, to correct us. And if you follow, if you live according to the, the way that God has commanded, the, the way that he has showed us, I guarantee you, I can guarantee you from the bottom of my heart that you will experience something better. Amen? Something better because Jesus not only makes our life better, he makes us better at life. So that's what we're going to be talking about in the next couple of weeks, about being strong and resilient people and just being better people. So if you're interested, you don't want to miss next week because this message is going to be okay, but next week is going to be good. Amen? All right, so let's pray so we can jump into our study today. Father, I come before you today and I thank you for this time and this space that you allow us, God, to... Uh, to gather, to get to study your word. Thank you for the families represented here today that um, have taken time out of the day to come worship with us. I pray that you will meet us in this place in a real and tangible way. Like every week, I pray humbly, God, that what I say today are not simply my thoughts, my principles or ideas, but that, God, that I can be an instrument in your hands so that your people, your church can hear your voice. Speak to us clearly, powerfully, and personally so that we can leave this place different than how we came in. And God, I pray all these things, and I give you thanks, and I do it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 So today I want to share a message of hope. I want to share a message of hope today. And to start, I want to read you some words of someone who knows what it was like to go through difficulties but we see in his life that difficulties didn't tear him down, but he was able to overcome and thrive in spite of it. And I'm talking about the Apostle Paul. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 35, 37 through 39, the word says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Praise God. If you read this text carefully and you actually underline, you will find... 17 different things that Paul mentions, 
things that threaten to separate us from God, things that threaten to take away our joy, to take away our hope, to knock us down, things that want to make us to give up. Uh, 17 different things. There's another passage of scripture in uh, the second letter that he wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 11. Um, he actually goes a little bit more into detail where he gives us more specific things that he went through. Paul mentions in that text, in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28, he says that he, he was shipwrecked, persecuted. He was beaten with rods and stones. He knew what it was like to feel hungry. He was naked at times, felt cold. Um, he was abandoned by his friends. At times he was homeless, falsely accused, unjustly uh, in, in prison and incarcerated. All of these things he went through in his life. And, uh, and we're going to see how, how it is that he responded to those things. And in the same way, maybe not so drastically, because we do live, thank God, in a free country. Maybe not so drastically do we go through those things. But there are things in our life that also threaten to, to take us away from God or threaten to take away our joy, threaten to take away our hope. And like I said earlier, the holiday season really does show a spike in these emotions and in this type of behavior. And I just want to share a couple of things that perhaps you, uh, maybe you're not looking forward to the holidays. Maybe this is a, a, a difficult time for you. Um, or you know somebody and, um, and you, you need a way to encourage them and to pray for them or whatever. Uh, but um, some things that threaten to take away our hope, for example, are traumatic events, a traumatic event. And this is usually something that happened when we were a child, whether you grew up in a home where you uh, maybe you witnessed some abuse or something very wrong, or perhaps you experienced personally some type of abuse in your life, whether it was verbal or physical or even sexual, or perhaps you you witness even just some traumatic event in your community or some type of natural disaster that really impacted you. And it was a traumatic event. This is something that um, scientists and psychologists, they, they call an adverse childhood event. And these things are not benign. These things are not like, oh, everybody goes through it, just get over it. No, these things are not benign. These things really have a big impact on our lives. And, and normally, when it happens to young children, what happens is that kids uh, or young, young kids, they don't have the cognitive ability or the language or vocabulary to express what they're feeling or to be able to communicate how certain things affect them. And what happens is that it, it just impacts their, their development, their social skills. It impacts their emotional and mental health. And it'll determine whether they're going to be troublesome in school or get into fights or even end up in jail or use drugs or whatever. So a traumatic event is something that, that really has a big impact in our lives. Secondly, things that uh, threaten to take away our hope are strained relationships. Strained relationships. And I'm thinking here about those primary relationships, especially within the family whether it's a, a difficult relationship with a parent or a sibling or, or somebody that's close to you, a marriage or even a close friend, when, when there is terrible conflict that impacts their relationship, it's very disruptive and, and it, can, it can have a very negative impact in our lives, in our hope, in our joy. And, um, you know, we just we just kind of want to throw in the towel because they're never going to change you. They're always going to be the same. Or I can't forgive anymore. Or I can't ask for forgiveness anymore. And we stop talking. You know, we, we don't talk to our sister or our cousins or even our parents or whatever. And those things, they really can take a toll in our, in our, in our, in our body, in our life. Uh, thoroughly health problems, whether it's your physical health or, or maybe even your mental health. You know, whether it's anxiety or depression or perhaps panic, panic attacks or anything like that. At times, man, we've done everything that we know how to do. We've gone to the doctors. We take the medicines. We've even prayed about it. We've fasted. And it just doesn't go away. And it just feels like a hopeless situation, like nothing works. We've changed our diet. we changed our lifestyle. And, and it, just, it just feels like things don't, don't change. Um, and it can definitely make us feel 
hopeless. Um, another one, another thing that I think all of us have gone through is crushing disappointment. At different levels, I think we can all identify with, um, we all know what it's like to expect one thing and experience something different, right? We, we expect the best or we want the best thing, but unfortunately we, we don't get it or we don't reach it or, or whatever. And, and, you know, maybe you planned the perfect way, but man, you, you weren't expecting a divorce. You weren't expecting an infidelity. Maybe you hoped for an exciting career and a job that you love, but you're in a dead end job that you don't really like, but you got to pay the bills. Or um, maybe you started your own business with the hope of being your own boss or, or doing something that you love, but it just didn't go the way that you thought that it would. And at times we live with this crushing pain, this disappointment and just feeling unfulfilled because we tried something and we just that crushing disappointment makes us to want to give up hope, to not ever want to try again and again, to not step out in faith, not get out of our comfort zone, and we just we just lose hope, we lose joy, and we just kind of go through life, just kind of going through the motions. Um, another thing that threatens us to take away our joy are unchangeable circumstances. Unchangeable circumstances. And again, this could be related to your physical health, Maybe you've been given some type of diagnosis and it's something that you just know you're never going to get over. Or perhaps, again, it's something with your mental health that you've tried everything and you just know that you're going to live with this for the rest of your life. It's something that is unchanging. But how many of us, men at times, even in our spiritual life, even in the things that we swore to God, we've repented a thousand times and we said that we would never do again. But we keep on falling. We keep on tri tripping. We keep on tripping with the same stone. And it's like, God, am I ever going to change? Am I ever going to be able to change this in my life? And at times, we just want to throw in the towel because we feel that it's an unchangeable circumstance. Yes, we're a newborn creation, right? We're a new creature in Christ. But, but man, we just keep going back to those old ways. And at times, those unchangeable circumstances in our life, they, um, man, they take away our hope and they take away our joy. And lastly, painful loss painful loss this is a loss of a loved one maybe a parent at a young age or, or a sibling or maybe even a close friend god forbid that you lose a child at a young age man that can definitely feel like man there's no hope there's no reason for joy anymore there's no reason for me to get my hopes up for anything anymore and at times man, we feel that we will never get over that loss, so we'll never get over that difficult thing that we went through, that, that pain, that painful loss. And I guarantee you that in a room this size, every single one of us, in one way or another, and I guarantee you, if I have 10 other categories, you could probably check those off as well, because some of you have gone through some things. But I guarantee you, maybe you've had it pretty easy, but I guarantee you that at least you've had trouble in some type of relationship. So all of us, are identified in this short list because all of these things they threaten to take away our hope to take away our joy and and at times especially during this time of year when the culture says oh it's time to be joyful it's time to be thankful and you're like well yeah thankful for what if you knew what i had gone through if you have experienced the things that i'm going through right now you wouldn't be telling me that, but honestly, and that's, that's, that really is the reason why these, these feelings of hopelessness and depression and anxiety, they really do spike up during the holidays. So what was the difference? Because we read earlier about all these things that Paul, the Apostle Paul, went through. These 17 different things that he described in more detail, different things that he had gone through. And, and still in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, he has the audacity to write from prison, nonetheless. He has the audacity to tell the believers in Christ to say, hey, by the way, rejoice in the Lord always. And I say it again, rejoice. How can, he, how can somebody, because if somebody had the right to be bitter, to be mad at God, to be angry, if somebody had the right, it was Paul, right? He was a, a church planner. I mean, he was just devoted to the cause of Christ, and he went through some stuff, right? 
Yeah, he's he's telling the churches and telling us, hey, rejoice in the Lord always. How? How does somebody go through so much stuff and still have joy in their heart and still have hope? Well, the um, what I want to talk about is what's the difference between the people that go through difficult times and um, men, as a result, they just end up completely crushed and depressed and stressed out and bitter the rest of their life. What's the difference between those people and other people that go through similar things, maybe even worse things, but they're able to overcome, not only survive it, but they're able to grow from it and overcome it and thrive in spite of it. Well, studies have shown that people that not only survive, but thrive in spite of their difficult situations and circumstances are, are not the people that you think it would be. It's not the wealthiest people. It's not the most educated or the most intelligent people. It's not the most influential or successful people that just get over things. It's not the people of a certain race or a certain gender. It has nothing to do with any of that. And it has everything to do with resilience. The word resilience is one that perhaps you don't know. We don't use it often. Um, but resilience, I have a definition. I just want to show you the definition that I'm working with. Um, the word resilience means that you're able to withstand or recover quickly from difficult conditions. Um, some synonyms of the word resilience could, could be strong, tough, hard, buoyant, right? Irrepressible, something you just can't keep it down. It just keeps popping up. Uh, flexible pliable, durable, right? Like, like Legos. Amen. Remember this? Like Legos. So, um, so, uh, being resilient is, is someone that is able to become strong, healthy, or successful again after experiencing something bad in their life, after something bad happened. Now, scientists have studied resilience and have wondered if it's genetic, if it's something that you just kind of pass down to you know from generation to generation and there might be some people that grow up in certain environments or circumstances that have you know a little bit of an inclination or a disposition towards resilience but what they have concluded is that resilience is actually a skill that can be learned it's not passed down through genetics right it's not something that you pass down in your family but it's an ability that can be learned. And I don't know about you, but that's good news for me because I want to be a resilient person, amen? I don't know if that's what you wanna be. I don't know if you wanna lose a job and finally just feel this way or, or lose a loved one or, or have sickness in the family and be completely destroyed. I don't know if that's what you wanna experience, but I wanna be able to go through some things and still get up and be strong, learn from it, grow from it, overcome it, and thrive in spite of it. And according to studies, we can because these are skills that can be learned. So to finish today, um, what I want to do, I want to show you today three principles for each of us to develop resilience. All right. Three principles for us to develop resilience. And, and uh, before we jump into the points, I want to show you that... Um, this is a biblical principle. The, the Bible might not use the word resilience. They actually use the word um, endurance or perseverance, which are also, they can be used as synonyms for the word resilience. But I just want you to see that this, this, this idea or this principle of developing this in your life is something very biblical and something very important. Romans, again, chapter 5, verses 3 to 5 says, We can rejoice too. When we run into problems and trials, why? For we know that they help us develop endurance. They help us develop resilience, right? Perseverance. Um, and that endurance or that resilience develops into strength of character. Do you know somebody with good character that's the same no matter where they are or what they go through? Amen? Um, and, and that character strengthens our confidence Hope in what? Hope in our circumstances? 
hope in the world, hope in our job, the economy, or my family. No, hope of salvation. And it says this hope will not lead to disappointment. It will not lead to disappointment. So this is something that can be learned, that can be developed. And uh, I just want to show, share with you three quick principles. The first one is um, if you want to be a resilient person, then you have to remember that you live in a broken world. You have to remember that you live in a broken world. For many of us that um, that grew up in the western part of the world, uh, you know, or or maybe we were raised or, or were born here in this, you know, in the United States or whatever, we have been blessed with so many freedoms, so many opportunities that I don't know how, but somehow we have got it into our brain that life is supposed to be easy, right? Sometimes we're convinced that we think that everything is just kind of supposed to come naturally without a lot of effort, that everything is supposed to be easy and relatively painless. But the truth of the matter is that, man, we sometimes we have these great expectations of what our lives should be, especially today, because we look on social media and we see the, uh, the filtered version of everybody's life. And we, we just think that our life needs to be excellent and this incredible life. And we just, we just have this incredible expectations of what our life needs to be. That when we go through a storm and when we go through difficulties, we're shocked. Right? We're like, oh my gosh, how did this happen? Or why did this happen to me? And what happens? With that uncertainty, with that shock comes confusion. And with the confusion comes frustration. And with the frustration comes anger and disillusionment and bitterness. And, and all because we thought, hey, life is supposed to be easy. And everything's just supposed to be relatively painless. But the truth of the matter is that, man, we live in a broken world that is filled with with sin, we're impacted by sin, and not only our own, we're impacted by other people's sins. People that we're not even in touch with or related to, we are still impacted by other people's sins. And, and the truth of the matter is that we are going to go through trouble. Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, he said, man, I told you these things so that you may have Peace. So he told us beforehand so that we wouldn't be surprised, that we wouldn't be shocked. He said, in this life, guess what? Surprise. It's not a surprise. You will have trouble. You will have trouble. In this world, you will go through difficult times. And um, Jesus didn't say perhaps or maybe or, you know, some people will. No, he said everybody. And um and the first way for us to be resilient people is, is by remembering, accepting, and just recognizing that in our life, not everything is going to be easy, painless, and convenient. Now, what I'm not saying, let me just pause for a second, because there is this saying out there, maybe, maybe you've heard it, maybe, maybe you've heard the saying, well, you know what, I just hope for the best, but expect the worst. That's not what I'm saying at all. That's terrible. That's terrible advice. You can think that way if you want to be a pessimist. If you want to just become super negative and, and be annoying to everybody in your life, then you can think that way. That's not what I'm saying at all. I, I, I'm, I'm encouraging you and that for, for you to hope for the best, for you to expect great things from God and from your life, from your efforts, because faith is important. What I am saying is that when things don't go as we expected, we don't need to be destroyed because our hope is not in this world. Our hope should not be tied to the things of this world. We should know that change is part of the human experience. Our ultimate goal, our ultimate hope, and our help, as the psalmist says, hey, my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. I'm going to lift my eyes because my help comes from the Lord. So when storms come, when difficulties come, I'm not destroyed because I know that my sovereign God is in control and that he can work even the difficult things. He can work them for the good of those that love him. So in the meantime, man, I'm going to remember that this world is broken. And when storms come my way, I'm not going to be shocked. 
I'm not going to be surprised. Therefore, I'm not going to be destroyed. Instead, I'm going to overcome it. I'm going to survive it. I'm going to surpass it. I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to keep my hope in the Lord. And I'm going to keep moving forward um, with resilience because that's what God has called us to. So secondly, um, secondly, we not only have to remember we live in a broken world, but we also we should take advantage of the resources that God gives us to cope with life, to cope with life. No me cupo. But take advantage of the resources God gives you to cope with life. Now, there's nothing more frustrating than to try to do a job with the wrong tools, to not have the right tool for the job. Now, I know we've all done it. We've all put back the electrical outlet with a butter knife. Come on now, if you can be honest, everybody has done this. You've painted a bedroom and then you're like, uh, I don't have a screwdriver, honey, give me a butter knife and we'll get this done, right? Um, we've all tried to hammer things. I can't find a hammer, just give me something hard and I'm gonna hammer this thing down. I don't know about you, but for some reason, I never have the right size batteries, right? Like, if I need triple A, I got double A's. If I need double A's, I got triple A's. And, and I never have a nine volt, who has nine volt batteries? So, um, and then, uh, this is actually, I was trying to find a, a picture of different batteries. This is actually a hack. You can actually, if you don't, if you need double A's and you only have triple A's, you can put a little ball of foil, uh, aluminum, 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 uh, to complete the connection and it works. Um, or when you lock your keys to your car, anybody been there? And you're, you're so, you're so confident. Oh, just give me a hanger. I'll get this done. Yeah, like you've done it before. You've never done it before, but you swear you can open the door with a hanger. Uh, but there's nothing more frustrating than to try to get a job done without the right tools. And I, I don't know about you, but I've experienced that I've, I've logged my keys in my car and tried for hours to try to get in myself. And then finally, I stop being stingy and I call one of those services like 60 bucks, right? It's so expensive, and in like a, a minute and a half, they're in there, so anyway. Because why? Because they had the right tool. They had the right tool for the job. And, uh, and man, many of us, we go through life without the right tools, in a way, right? I heard this guy say one time that if all you have is a hammer, you'll tend to treat everything like a nail, right? And you'll just start smacking things around and, and you know, we need different things to cope with life. And God offers us these tools and these resources. And, and we should take advantage of that. And there's a lot of them, but I just want to share three of them quickly. Uh, first of all, God, he, he gives us and he offers us a guide. A guide. And this is important because, man, in the middle of all of our trials, that's the time when, when we feel all alone. We feel that we can't count on anybody um, and um, man, God offers us a guide and I love, we spent all summer in Psalm 23 and I just love the imagery of, of this Psalm where God tells us, hey, I, I'm like a shepherd. I wanna lead you, right? It, 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 the Lord is my shepherd, I like nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. What does it say? He leads me, he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. What does he do? He guides me along the right path. This is something that God offers us. And he does it for his name's sake. And, and I just want to say that, that when we faced our biggest problem, the problem that we could never overcome by our own effort or merit, which is that we were separated from God because of our sin, that's the biggest problem that we have ever faced or that we will ever face. And, and even in our biggest problem, man, when we couldn't reach God, God came to us. That's what we celebrate in Christmas, that, that God came down and to, to repair that. On the cross, he broke the chains of sin and, and he gives us access for us to have a personal relationship with him. And, and when we believe, when we accept Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, not only does he forgive us of our sins? Not only is his death sufficient, 
to pay for our sin debt. But man, he, he not only becomes our savior, but he becomes our shepherd, our guide. He becomes our friend. And God offers that to us. Secondly, he offers us a new mind. He offers us a new, a new mind. When we believe in Christ as our Lord and Savior, he, he gives us a new heart. He renews our mind. And um, it, from our perspective, this is not instantaneous, right? I mean, from God's perspective in that instant, we are holy in his sight. We are declared innocent, and that's it. We are his children. But from our perspective, this is not something that occurs instantly. But over time, as we grow in our faith, in our knowledge of God, in our intimacy, in our relationship with him, with time, our thoughts will become, will, will just align with the thoughts of God. Our heart, our feelings, our priorities, our inclinations, our desires they will line up with the heart of God. And, and that's what Paul, again, is admonishing us to say, hey, don't conform to the patterns of this world, but instead be transformed by renewing your mind. Because everything starts in the mind. If there's something that you want to change in your life, any area in your life that you want to change, whether it's your phys physical or your health or your finances, or a relationship or whatever, then you need to start by changing the way you think about that particular thing because everything starts in our mind. And when we align our mind and our heart with God, man, at, at times we might not understand everything. At times we might not even enjoy the plan or why am I doing this, man? I'd rather be doing this other thing. But we can always trust the purposes of God. Why? Because it's good. It's pleasing. And it's perfect. And that's what this, this verse continues to say. Renew your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And, and, and when we align our heart and our minds with the Lord, then man, we, we can be at peace because we know that His will and His purposes are perfect. I love this verse in Romans 8, 6, where it says that letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. Just being led by your emotions, being led by what you feel, if it feels good, do it. Yeah, that's going to end us in a place that is not pleasant. That leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind, taking advantage of this resource of God renewing our mind, man, it leads to life and peace. And we need to take advantage of that. And then thirdly, the way that we are, one of the ways that we renew our mind is what? It's through his word. And this is the third resource that God, that I want to share with you, that God uh, shares with us. Now, if you are not a person that regularly reads the Bible, I know the Bible can seem um, intimidating. It's a you know a book of ancient writings, and it's like, where do I even start? Like, do I start in Genesis, or do I start in Matthew, or you know? Um, but what I know is that the way that you see or the way that you think about God's word, it really is going to determine what you do with it. For example, if you think of God's word as a textbook, right? It's just something you know for me to learn from. Well, unless you're a nerd, you're not going to sit around reading a textbook, right? I don't want to offend you if you're a nerd, but most of us, we don't want anything else to do with school, right? So you're not going to really dig into this if you think of it as a textbook. If you think about it as a history book, you know, there's history about the nation of Israel. There's a history of Jesus. If you like history, you enjoy that, you know, you might get into it. But most people don't really dig into history, right? Um, if you think of it as just like an insurance policy, well, this is my fire insurance, right? So I don't burn up in hell, right? Well, nobody reads insurance policies. We just sign that thing. Just, hey, I'm, I hope for the best. We don't read the small print on those things. We just sign it and pay for it month after month and hope we don't have to use it. Um, you know, but uh, the way that you see God's word, the way that you think about it really is going to determine what you do with it. If you think about God's word, if you see it as what it is, a love letter, 
That's what it is. It's a love letter from a loving father that wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. He wants to advise you. He wants to reveal his heart, his plans, his purposes, his promises to you. It's my hope that if you see it that way, that you would be all over it. And again, I want to commend you and the people that are in the Bible app. I see you completing your Bible reading plans and marking your verses. And I, I applaud you for that. And I encourage you to keep digging into God's word because it really is the way that he transforms us. And the Bible is described in many different ways. But um, one particular way that called my attention is, is this verse in Psalm 119, verse 105, where it says that the Bible or the word is, is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path, right? The Bible is like this, this lamp um, because this is in the middle of our storms. It's in the middle of something really dark that the enemy attacks us. And, um, and we really start thinking and believing two very important lies. These are two lies. And the two lies are when we go through difficult times, we think this is never going to go away. This is never going to pass away. And secondly, we think, man, I'll never get over this. And those are two lies because if you think back to maybe some things that you've gone through before that you thought they would never pass, guess what? They did pass. When you thought that something happened that you would never get over that, when you look back, guess what? You got over it. But in the middle of that storm, in the middle of the darkness, the enemy is just like, no, this is never going to go away. You're never going to overcome this. And, and we just look at our future and it's just uncertainty and darkness and in that moment, I want you to think as the word of God, as this lamp onto your feet that wants to lead you. But I don't want you to think of it as like a flashlight like today, right? Because you turn on a flashlight, you can light up 100 yards out. Or maybe even the high beams on your car. You turn on the high beams, you see the whole road. I want you to think back to the first century, right? I want you to think about a little, a little lamp, a little gas lamp. That when you light it up, you probably see maybe one, two, two steps ahead of you. So if you want to see further ahead, what do you have to do? You got to take a step if you want to see further ahead. Because you're only going to be able to see one or two steps forward. So if you want to see what's ahead, then you got to take your next step. And, and the word of God is very similar in that way in that God is not going to show us steps four five and six until we take steps one two and three does that make sense god is not going to show us these great revelations until we learn how to take little baby steps and, and as we take steps faithfully then he will show us more so what's your next step maybe for you man your your next step is to accept jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, or to be baptized, to declare your faith publicly, do not be ashamed that, that you are a follower of Jesus, Jesus or, or to forgive somebody, to not keep hanging on to a grudge, or, or maybe even to, to ask for forgiveness, because that, that guilt and that shame, it just overwhelms you. So if you want to experience freedom, if you want to see what God has next, then we need to be willing to take different steps and be faithful. So what we've covered so far, if you want to be a resilient, strong, enduring, persevering person like Legos, right? That I can step on them, I can hit them, I can do whatever. And, and man, they're going to be just fine. I'm going to be able to get up and overcome and thrive and, and, and still be successful. Then we need to remember, we need to remember that we live in a broken world that our hope shouldn't be in this world. We should take advantage of the, of the resources that God offers us, right? These, these tools, the right tools for the job. A guide, a new mind, a new perspective. Align our heart and our mind with God so that he can guide us through his word. But third, and finally, and to finish today, um, man, we need to remember, we need to remember that um, at the end of the day, you are the one that chooses your responses in life. 
you choose. Remember that you get to choose your responses in life. There's a lot of things in our life that we don't have control over. There's a lot of things that we just, we don't get to choose. You didn't get to choose where you were born, when you were born, in what family you were born to, or the fa or which family raised you. You didn't get to choose those things. The list that we covered in the beginning, those things that threatened to take away our hope, you didn't choose that traumatic event. You would never choose a, a relationship in your life to be strained. You would never choose a, a painful loss or, an, or this incredible disappointment or th these things that we go through. We, you would never choose an illness or a diagnose, bad diagnosis or you would never choose to be lied to or betrayed or, or to lose a loved one. It's something you would never choose, but at the end of the day, man, there's so much that we don't have control over. But we do choose how it is that we respond. How it is that we respond to the storms that come our way. And in a way, this is freedom. This is freedom that we have, that we get to choose, right? We are not held captive by the things that happen to us. We, we live in a broken world. We are going to have go through trouble. But, but those things, even the things that don't go according to our plans. Man, when you put your faith in Christ, you acknowledge that our faith is not in our plans. Our faith is in Christ. It's in him who, who has the ultimate plan. Him that has a purpose, a reason. Him that is indeed in control. Our faith is not in our plans, but in the perfect will and purposes of God. And to finish, I want to remind you of the story of Jesus. Um, when he was praying before he was arrested, remember the scene where he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he was praying so intensely that he was sweating drops of blood. And what was his prayer? His prayer was, God, if there's any other way, if you could please pass this cup for me, if there's any other way, please pass it. What, what, what was he saying? God, I don't like the plan. Like, I, I'm not going to enjoy this. But, but he said, hey, my faith and my hope is not in the plan. I might not understand it. I might not like it. But my hope is in you. I'm going to trust in you. And what he say? but... You know, pass it if you can, but let it not be my will, but your will be done. Your will be done. And um, if you remember, Jesus was arrested. He was beaten. He was tortured. He was spit upon. They yanked his beard. They nailed him on a cross. They speared him until he finally cried out in desperation. He said, God, why have you forgotten me? Why are you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I want to remind you that even in the moments that God is silent, and even in the moments when you, it seems that God is absent, He's not. Even when God is silent, it doesn't mean that he is absent because it was in that moment when Jesus felt abandoned, when God felt the most distant, the most silent, the, the most absent. It was at that moment that God was doing his greatest work. He was paying for your sin and for mine. He was opening a way for us to be able to have a personal relationship with him. Making a way for us to be forgiven, for us to be redeemed, for us to be washed clean and adopted into his family. And then if you remember after God, after Jesus cried out, he finally couldn't do it anymore. And he just said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit 
Into your hands, I commit my spirit. Completely trusting, not in his circumstances, not in his condition, but in the will and the purposes of God. So I ask you, how are you going to respond to adversity? Are you going to raise your fist at God and be filled with anger and bitterness and depression and anxiety and just <clears throat> crumble down as a person which is going to impact everybody? Are you going to be destroyed by the adversities in life? Or are you simply going to say, you know what? My hope is not in this world. God, into your hands I commit my spirit, my life, my circumstances. I don't like it right now, but I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to trust you. So are we going to throw in the towel or are we going to commit our life and our difficult situations to God? Trusting in his plans and his purposes and not our own. Taking advantage of his resources to grow, to learn, to develop resilience, endurance, and perseverance in our lives for his glory, for our good, and for everybody around us benefit. Amen? Resilience is something that is not, it's not genetically passed down. It can be learned. And next week, I want to I share with you some practical choices that we can make to be more resilient people. But today, I simply want to finish by sharing with you and reading again the way that Paul chose to respond to his adversities. Again, I read in Romans 8, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or death? No, in all these states, we are more than conquerors. And we'll talk about what that means next week. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen.